Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Sami, and it is my distinct pleasure to serve as your MC today. Thank you for joining us. Your presence here today speaks volumes for supporting those who seek a democratic, free, non-nuclear republic based on separation of religion and state. A few words about myself. I am a second-generation Iranian-American born in the United States to Iranian parents who were students uh, during the time of the 1979 revolution. My parents did not need to experience Iran post-revolution to know what living under a dictatorship meant, given that my mother was a political prisoner under the previous dictatorship of the Shah. I was raised exposed to the atrocities and oppression imprisoned Iranians faced under Khomeini's rule. Thus, I was inspired to study international affairs at the George Washington University and made my way to law school, where I graduated with a concentration in comparative and international law. I currently practice in the field of immigration, defending those who seek refuge against persecution. The despotic agents of the Shah's Savak never imagined that the child of a former political prisoner would one day live to stand before them, defiant and imbued with the highest value, that of freedom. <laughs> and an unwavering allegiance to those who risked it all and paid the ultimate price so that we could all stand here today, a voice amongst many on the path to a free Iran. The ongoing uprising in Iran is focused on rejecting the regime in its entirety, as well as any form of dictatorship, as Iranians chant, death to Khamenei and death to the oppressor, be it the Shah, or the Supreme Leader. <laughs> women, women have been in the forefront of the opposition to the regime over the past four decades. The younger generation and Gen Z have played a key role in the uprisings as they took heed from the experiences of decades-long resistance against the regime by the generations before them. Many among them have chosen to join the resistance units in leading the fight on the streets. Today, we are going to hear from distinguished speakers, from those who represent the Iranian resistance, as well as Americans who support the uprisings as they promote a sound policy regarding Iran. They include the 48th Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, General Wesley Clark, <laughs> Ambassador, Ambassador Sam Brownback, <laughs> Ambassador Gary Locke, <laughs> Senator Robert Torricelli, <laughs> and Mr. Mark Short. With that, I now have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Joining us live via satellite from Europe, Mrs. Maryam Rajavi, the President-elect of the National Council of Resistance of Iran.
همه هموطنان گرامی و به ویژه شما اشرف نشان ها که با تلاش and all supporters of the resistance that have accomplished many successes and have disclosed the regime and its plots. Thank you all. Vice President Mike Pence, General Wesley Clark, Ambassador Sam Brombach, Ambassador uh, Gary Locke, Senator Torricelli, uh, Mr. Uh, Mark Short, distinguished personalities, dear compatriots, I salute you all with a special greetings to the distinguished figures of the United States who support the noble struggle of the Iranian people to overthrow the regime and establish freedom and democracy. It has been nearly six months since Iran's nationwide uprising began. Despite the regime's widespread crackdown on the protest uh, movement, uh, Iran uprising remains the most significant threat to the existence of the regime. In a state of uh, weakness, the regime has resorted to committing any crime to stop the uprising, resulting in tens of thousands of arrests and at least 750 deaths. In the past three months, the regime has carried out a horrific crime by poisoning thousands of schoolgirls nationwide through chemical attacks to stop the uprising. Despite this brutal suppression, the regime has failed to uproot the uprising because first, this uprising has roots in the explosive state of the society, poverty, unemployment, and above all, the catastrophic situation of women. Second, the resistance units and a nationwide network of the uh, organized resistance inside the country play a serious role in the uprising. For this reason, the situation in Iran will never return to before the beginning of this uprising. The cries of death to Khamenei have spread across Iran. People have no fear and nothing to lose. <clears throat> the regime has become weaker and faces more uh, defections. Uh, it cannot prevent the explosive situation because that needs fundamental reforms which will in turn lead to the regime's overthrow. But the explosive situation of society does not lead to the overthrow of the regime by itself. Without the presence of an organized force ready to make sacrifices, this situation will not have a result in favor of people. To set the great social engine in motion, an organized and dedicated force is inevitable. During his visit, uh, his visit in June to Ashraf III after witnessing a part of the Iranian resistances, pain and suffering in its uh, confrontation with the regime in the resistances museum, Vice President Pence said, resistance units in Iran are uh, the center of hope for the Iranian people, an engine for change from within during the uprisings and continued protests. And every day it's uh, clear they are growing stronger while the regime uh, grows weaker. Today, we are witnessing the work of that engine across the country. Despite the regime's extensive arrests 
increasing number of people joined the MEK resistance units during the uprising. Recently, the resistance units uh, undertook dozens of anti-regime operations daily, including burning regime symbols. As a result, the regime is making every effort to eliminate the MEK, resorting to demonization campaigns in addition to suppression. The regime has never hesitated uh, to use its so-called uh, opponents uh, to confront its primary enemy, the MEK. This is because the regime sees the MEK as the engine of the uprising and overthrow. In this context, uh, the regime seeks to uh, overshadow the democratic alternative by promoting uh, remnants of the previous regime, which is nothing but a transition from the current regime to the former regime. The Iranian regime strongly reject any kind of dictatorship, including the uh, return to monarchy. One of the most widely chanted slogans has become dead to the oppressor, be the Shah or the Mullahs. The Iranian uh, people fully understand that the monarchy in Iran has always been a, a manifestation of fascism. During Shah, all freedom, all freedom fighters were uh, either imprisoned or executed, which enabled the mullahs to hijack the leadership of the revolution. Today, the Iranian people are fully aware that they must distance themselves from all forms of dictatorship. The Iranian resistance has called for the formation of the National Solidarity Front since 2002. This front has been proposed based on three principles. First, the overthrow of the regime in its entirety. Second, the formation of a democratic republic. And third, the separation of religion and the state. Today, the democratic forces and the protesters are uniting around these three principles. Distinguished guests, today uh, young boys and girls are uh, shooting. Today, uh, young boys and girls are shouting, we will fight, we will die, we will take back Iran in the streets of our country. These chants echo, yes. yes. over it's four just, decades it's of resistance and the sacrifices of 120,000 martyrs on the path to freedom. The current situation of the Iranian people is best reflected in the famous statement of Patrick Henry in March uh, 1775, give me liberty or give me death. We are aware of the difficulties of the difficulties. Uh, we are aware of the difficulties on the path ahead, but uh, no obstacle can deter us from pursuing our objectives. The ruling religious fascism in Iran can and must be overthrown. The missing link in Western policy is its uh, exclusion of the Iranian people and the resistance from the uh, equation in Iran. Uh, this has harmful effects, not only on the people of Iran, but also on the region and the world. 
House Resolution 100 entitled Expressing Support uh, for the Iranian People's Desire for a Democratic, uh, Secular and Non-Nuclear Republic of Iran provides a framework for a principled policy. The resolution affirms that Congress stands with the people of Iran who are legitimately defending their rights for freedom against repression. The National Council of Resistance of Iran is... The National Council of Resistance of Iran Council is the most long-lasting political coalition in the modern history of Iran. The NCRI is fighting for the establishment of a democratic republic in Iran, which guarantees free elections, freedom of speech and assembly, the separation of religion and state, gender equality, autonomy for nationalities, and a non-nuclear Iran. On behalf of the resistance uh, of the Iranian people, I call on the United States to declare the Iranian people's struggle to overthrow the regime as just necessary and legitimate. Recognize the right of rebellious use right to rebellious use, <laughs> defend to defend, <laughs> recognize the right recognize of the rebellious use the right to defend the themselves against the terrorist Revolutionary Guards, IRGC. Thank you all very much. All very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Rajavi, for your eloquent remarks echoing the voice of the Iranian resistance and reminding everyone of their responsibilities to help bring about change in Iran. Indeed, 
only an organized force ready to sacrifice can succeed in bringing about true change in Iran. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the utmost honor of inviting to the stage someone who has stood on the side of the Iranian people and their organized resistance over the span of two decades. He fought relentlessly for their rights and called for holding the ruthless rulers of Iran accountable. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 48th Vice President of the United States, 50th Governor of Indiana, the Honorable Mike Well, thank you, Anahita, and thank you all for that warm welcome. It is my great honor to welcome you back to our nation's capital for this Washington summit in support of a free and democratic Iran. It's an honor to address the organization of Iranian-American communities and to share this podium today with a distinguished group of Americans that I deeply admire, who represent a cross-section of support in the United States for this cause. And let me be clear, I am here and they are here because we share a common cause, the liberation of the Iranian people from decades of tyranny and the rebirth of a free, peaceful, prosperous and democratic Iran. So thank you all for your strong stand here across our country and for the, the people of Iran who long for liberty. To the President-elect of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, Maryam Rajavi, my friend. <laughs> to all of my friends watching from Ashraf 3. And to all who gather here today, I know I speak on behalf of tens of millions of Americans of both political parties and every political philosophy. When I say from my heart, the American people support your goal of establishing a secular, democratic, non-nuclear Iranian republic that derives its powers from the consent of the government. It's a privilege to be with so many wonderful Iranian Americans. You know, many American citizens trace their family roots to Iran. More than 1.5 million Americans were born in Iran, which means the United States is home to more members of the Iranian diaspora than any other nation on earth. And America has been incredibly enriched by their contributions to our culture, our economy, and our society. Most Iranian Americans came to the United States following the tragic events after the revolution in 1979. 
you chose to make America your home because you know that America is and will always remain the land of liberty holding aloft the flame of freedom for our people and people around the world. And greatly to your credit, you did not forget those left behind. And for those that were left behind, I scarcely need to say to the families gathered here or in Albania looking on, or people in Iran that are looking on as well. Life has been full of misery and hardship since those days. What the Iranian people have endured since 1979 will be recorded by history as one of the great tragedies of the modern era. As a former elected leader, as an American citizen, as a Christian who believes that all people are created in the image of God, the Iranian people have always had a special place in my heart. In 2009, like so many other Americans, I remember watching with great hope in anticipation as the people of Iran began rising up to reclaim their birthright of freedom. In 2009's uprising, millions of courageous men and women filled the streets of Tehran and Tabriz. And what seemed like every city and village in between, they denounced a fraudulent election and demanded an end to decades of repression. Those brave protesters then looked to the leader of the free world for support but as I saw firsthand, as a member of the Congress of the United States, America remained silent. As a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I recognized that the lack of action was simply an abdication of American leadership. The American cause is freedom. And in this cause, America must never be silent. Then, working with Democrat Congressman Howard Berman, we authored a resolution expressing America's support. Where our administration remained silent, leaders in both political parties stepped forward in the House of Representatives to stand with the courageous young Iranian protesters. I'm proud to say that resolution in that year passed almost unanimously in the House of Representatives, and then it passed unanimously in the United States Senate, and within a matter of days, the Obama administration joined the chorus of Americans supporting the cause of a free Iran. The American people are with you, yesterday, today, and always. Unfortunately, the Obama administration's half-hearted support and hesitation in speaking out ultimately emboldened Iran's tyrannical rulers. We remember the crackdown on the dissent that occurred and the brutality that followed. The 2009 uprising was ruthlessly put down. As I said at the time, what we were witnessing was a Tiananmen in Tehran. But the enduring hope for a free Iran can never be extinguished. And that is clearer to me today than ever before. I can see in your eyes, in the countenance and confidence in your face, I can see in the faces of the people that we met at Ashraf 3 when my wife and I traveled there not long ago. The people of Iran will someday be free. And I'm proud that under the Trump-Pence administration, America did not turn a deaf ear to the pleas of the Iranian people. We did not remain silent in the face of Iranian regime's countless atrocities and sowing violence across the region. We stood with the freedom-loving people in Iran. We canceled the Iran nuclear deal, which had flooded the regime's coffers with tens of billions of dollars, money that it used to repress its own people and support deadly terror attacks around the world. 
We imposed crippling new sanctions on Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. We launched a campaign of maximum pressure, punishing the regime for its belligerent behavior and assault on its own citizens. We vigorously enforced sanctions to bring Iran's exports of oil to nearly zero and deny the regime its principal source of revenue. And we called on the free nations of the world to stand with us and with the Iranian people. We encourage world leaders to condemn Iran's unelected dictators and defend the Iranian people's unalienable right to determine their own destiny. In no uncertain terms, the Trump-Pence administration told our allies in the United Kingdom, Germany, France, that the JCPOA was a dangerous mistake that would cost the world dearly. We made it abundantly clear that the United States would never allow Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. We confronted the regime's malign activities across the region and didn't hesitate to take decisive action to put an end to the most dangerous terrorist in the world, Qasem Soleimani is gone. On the day we left office, the Iranian regime was more isolated than ever before. But sadly, a new administration arrived in Washington, D.C. a little more than two years ago. And President Biden and his administration are threatening to unravel all the progress we made in marginalizing the tyrannical regime in Tehran. This administration has been working overtime to restore the Iran nuclear deal, putting Tehran back on a fast track, not to preventing it obtaining a nuclear weapon, but to ensuring its capacity to do so at some time in the future. In fact, the Biden administration has admitted that under a restored nuclear deal, Iran would be capable of amassing enough nuclear fuel for a bomb in less than one year even faster than what was allowed under the previous deal. They even waived sanctions imposed by the Trump-Pence administration related to the Iranian regime's nuclear activities. And the Biden administration has even worked closely with Russia to revive talks for a new Iran nuclear deal, even as Vladimir Putin and the Russian army engage in their unprovoked an unconscionable invasion of Ukraine. These actions are ill-advised and unwise. Appeasement has never worked, and it never will. A renewed nuclear deal won't lead to peace and stability. It will lead to more terrorism, death, and destruction, and destabilize the region. A renewed deal won't block Iran's path to a nuclear bomb. It will pave it in gold. A renewed nuclear deal won't benefit the people of Iran in any way, shape, or form. It will empower and enrich the regime that has tormented and tortured the Iranian people for generations. So today, we call on the Biden administration to stand with the people of Iran, stand up for the cause of freedom and justice, and cease and desist all efforts in support of nuclear negotiations with Tehran. Peace is only possible with strength. After the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, I believe the adversaries of freedom in the world have been emboldened. They're emboldened to test our resolve. I believe that's in part 
what accounts for Vladimir Putin's unprovoked invasion in Ukraine. Ours was the only administration in the 21st century where Russia did not even attempt to redraw international lines by force. And there was a reason. Just as the free world must stand with the Iranian people against tyranny, let me say to my fellow countrymen gathered here, with America as the leader of the free world, we must ensure that the free world stands with the Ukrainian people to repel the Russian invasion. There's an old saying, weakness arouses evil. The evil now rising in Iran and around the world speaks to uh, perception of weakness. And that too will change. But let me assure you, even if the policies of the current American administration appear weak, let there be no doubt the American people remain strong. And the American people remain absolutely committed to supporting freedom around the world and to standing with everyone in Iran who aspires for a free and democratic future. And there is hope. As all of you know, the Iranian regime has never been weaker than it is today. Four out of five Iranians now live below the poverty line. Corruption is at an all-time high. The Iranian people are fed up, ready for change. The regime's sole focus now is on maintaining its precarious grip on power, which grows weaker by the day. That's no question why they, they selected Abraham Raisi to serve as the Iranian president. I hardly need to tell many of you just how evil Raisi is. Many of you in this room, many of you looking on, lost loved ones at Raisi's hand. You lost homes and livelihoods. You bear the scars of his brutality in your bodies. Some of you barely escaped with your lives. But today, let me say again, His crimes will not go unpunished. Abraham Raisi is unworthy of leading the great nation of Iran. He must be removed from office by the people of Iran and prosecuted for crimes against humanity and genocide. Today, the resistance movement in Iran has never been stronger. Every day, we're inspired by the courage of young women and men taking to the streets without regard to their personal safety to stand for a free and democratic future. Resistance units in Iran are, at the, are the wellspring of hope for the Iranian people. They're an engine for change from within during the uprisings and continued protests. And every day they're growing stronger while the regime grows weaker. <laughs> With MEK's leadership, teachers, workers, retirees have courageously taken to the streets in over 280 cities in 31 provinces. Students. Students from more than 130 universities, even high school students, have brought new energy to the cause. Protests used to be isolated and sporadic. Now, as the world media watches what they can, protests have been going on nonstop for the last six months. The regime, not surprisingly, has brutally murdered hundreds in the streets. Tens of thousands have been unjustly arrested, yet the Iranian people remain defiant and continue to stand for freedom. I truly believe this is not just another protest. 
It's a revolution in the making. And it's owing to the confidence and faith of all of you, and most especially to the brave Iranians, especially the women who've paid an enormous price, leading the decades-long fight for freedom and justice. The Iranian people, by all accounts, are more united than ever before. Hope is a flame in the heart of freedom-loving men and women, and that flame is burning brighter than ever before, thanks to all of you. All of you who stand unequivocally on the side of the Iranian people in support of their resistance units. You know, one of the biggest lies of the ruling regime to the world is that there's no alternative to the status quo. But you know different. There is an alternative. A well-organized, fully prepared, perfectly qualified, popularly supported alternative. And I want to thank Maryam Rajavi for her outstanding leadership and vision. You are an inspiration to the world. Regime should know that we're not fooled by the fake reformers and regime puppets pretending to be moderates. We know that many of these so-called reformers offer nothing more than false hope and the illusion of change. But the people of Iran want real change. And the real change is exactly what M.E.K. offers. As I mentioned, it was a great honor for my wife and I to visit Ashraf III in Albania last year. We saw firsthand the dedication of the men and women gathered there and this great movement to democracy, human rights, and the freedom for every citizen of Iran. Maryam Rajavi's 10-point plan for the future of Iran will ensure freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, and the freedom of every Iranian to choose their elected leaders. And I just received word arriving in Washington, D.C., word that I hope is an encouragement to all of you here, all of you looking on from Ashraf III, and all those who long for freedom in Iran. But just this week, more than 220 members of the United States House of Representatives in both political parties co-sponsored a resolution expressing support for the Iranian people's desire for a democratic, secular, and non-nuclear republic of Iran. commend all the Iranian Americans in the room for encouraging our elected representatives to co-sponsor such action. And I urge every member of the House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats, to join in this resolution. Yes. Now, the mullahs were outraged, but that's one more reason to co-sponsor the resolution. Yeah. And those members of Congress should wear their outrage as a badge of honor. And again, let me say, I congratulate the Republicans and Democrats who step forward to take this stand for freedom. 
The regime in Tehran wants to trick the world into believing that the Iranian protesters want to return to dictatorship of the Shah. But we're not confused by their lies. The Iranian people do not want to replace one dictator with another. The Iranian people want to be free. And I know that Iran can be a great nation once again. We all know the rich history of Iran, stretching back to time immemorial. It's a story of a people who've made boundless contributions to art, music, literature, science, commerce. And that story is far from over. Ronald Reagan said, and I quote, there is no arsenal and no weapon in the arsenals of the world so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. And it was true then. And it's true today. We know the vast untapped potential of the Iranian people. Here in the United States, you've proven what people can achieve when they're free to pursue their hopes and dreams. So let me say from my heart, in this hour and this moment of opportunity, all free nations of the world must continue to support the Iranian people in their calls for freedom and demand that Iran's leaders cease their dangerous and destabilizing actions at home and abroad. We stand with the people of Iran because it is right. And because the regime in Tehran threatens the peace and security of the world. But have faith. An unbroken truth of history is that no oppressive regime can last forever. For inside the human heart is an unquenchable fire that burns to be free. Just as the Soviet Union collapsed under the weight of its own sins, Someday and someday soon, that will be the fate of the oppressors in Iran. The day will come when the unelected ayatollahs release their iron-fisted grip on Iran and her people, and a new glorious day will dawn, a bright future will begin, ushering in an era of peace, prosperity, stability, and freedom for the good people of Iran and the world. Let that be our resolve, and let that be our prayer to a free Iran. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your strong words. Uh, as usual, you addressed the main issue about Iran, that is the alternative and the future of Iran. This is what the regime and all its allies fear the most. Your support for the Iranian people and the Iranian resistance is valuable. The Iranian people will never forget their friends at hardship. As you truly said, the day of freedom will come. God bless you. God bless you. خودم و همچنین از طرف مجاهدین از اشرف سه که در تصاویر هیئت حزب دموکرات کردستان ایران رو می‌بینیم مجاهدین از اشرف سه به برادران و خواهران کردشون خوش آمد مجاهدین فرام اشرف تریز دی سی ویلکام تو دی برادرز اند سیسترز تو کردیش برادرز اند سیسترز وی ویلکام دم
Thank you, Vice President Pence, for that magnificent speech. Indeed, the resistance movement has never been stronger, and we are inspired by the women sacrificing in this revolution, fighting for a free Iran. The Iranian people certainly want to be free and do not want to replace one dictator with another. I would now like to invite on the stage the Vice President's Chief of Staff, Mr. Mark Short, to join us for a moderated discussion with Vice President Pence regarding Iran. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me back. It's uh, great to be with you, and uh, it's a great honor to, to be here uh, celebrating the opportunity for a future free Iran. Um, Mr. Vice President, I think everybody was obviously very encouraged and enthused by your remarks. I think we have about 20 minutes, so if I can just dive into a few pieces of that to expand on a little bit further, uh, let us do that. You bet. You mentioned uh, House Resolution 100. In, uh, in this current Congress, Congressman Tom McClintock has authored and now has 224 co-signers to his resolution that cites the 10-point plan of President-elect Miriam Rajavi for the future of Iran. What is the significance of laying out a vision for a pro-freedom future Iran? Well, first, uh, Mark Short and I have worked together for more than a decade. He is a champion for freedom in his own right, and uh, I'm very proud of him. I also want to say, looking at uh, this rather intimidating front row of, uh, of diverse bipartisan leaders, would you give all of them a round of applause? I know you're here. Ambassador, the general. I think the importance of the 10-point plan is that what, what I believe is evidence in that the growing support for the resolution in the Congress is it, it gives, it gives a, a, a structure to a vision for Iran post-dictatorship by the Ayatollahs uh, or or it's past. And it says, here, here is a vision uh, that, uh, that, that reflects much of the Jeffersonian vision at the American founding that I think makes it possible. And this is a tribute to the Iranian-American community and the progress that you've made. For the American people to see clearly the separation between the tyrants in, in Tehran and the Iranian people. The 10-point plan proves that the Iranian people want to enter the family of nations and recognize the God-given liberties that are at the foundation uh, of freedom. And uh, I, commend, uh, uh, I commend Mrs. Rajavi and I commend uh, this organization for sharing that vision. Um, uh, in my conversation, uh, with Mrs. Rajavi earlier today, we spoke about the fact that uh, before 1979, when the Ayatollah went to Paris, he spoke in, the, in vague terms about what the future would look like. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and when the Shah fell and they came in, the world was horrified at what, what took over this great nation. Um, and I believe the 10-point plan gives evidence of the fact that this, this movement is different than any movement in the past. And it's a movement that's grounded in democratic principles uh, and, a, and a commitment to stability and peace. And I, that's why I, I, uh, I think the 10-point plan, the affirmation of that in the congressional resolution, the widening support and awareness uh, across the United States of America um, is great hope for the future. And it's going to continue to embolden um, this administration, I hope, and future administrations to stand with the freedom-loving people of Iran, here and around the world.
in your remarks, you also discussed uh, the Trump-Pence administration's decision to withdraw from JCPOA. I recall as a staffer, there were a lot of calls coming into you and to the president from European leaders, members of Congress, many within the State Department, imploring you and begging the administration to stay in the JCPOA. Can you share with the audience a little bit of what that pressure campaign was like and why it was important to take that stand? Well, I think, I think to say that, that uh, virtually uh, every relevant leader in the world was opposed to us doing that would be an understatement. I mean, I was there for many of those calls. When President Trump was again urged to remain in the deal, we, and candidly, it wasn't just foreign leaders. Many in the diplomatic corps in the United States echoed the same, felt that we ought to stay in the JCPOA, but uh, I, I, give, I give President Trump credit uh, for keeping his word. We told the American people we would get out of the disastrous Iranian nuclear deal, and we did. Uh, and I think that, that decision uh, in and of itself um, set us on a different path with regard to Iran uh, in the region. And as I said, the day we left office now more than two years ago, Iran was more isolated than ever before. Um, but it, it, uh, it, 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 to, to say that there was uh, overwhelming opposition to stepping out of that deal uh, uh, would would uh, be accurate, but um, uh, America proved that when you when you lead for freedom, uh, that the world responds, and the world, and particularly that part of the world, changed during our season of service because of it. As, as this current administration continues to look at ways to re-enter the JCPOA, there are a lot of other events that are now happening on the world stage, from a Russian invasion into Ukraine, a continuing growing threat from China. To what extent is Iran able to capitalize on the world's attention being elsewhere, whether or not it's the recent stories we've read about school children uh, being poisoned in Iran, or whether or not it's the continued pursuit of a nuclear program what, how, how are they able to take advantage of the world's attention being elsewhere, and what responsibility does the current administration have to make sure that the world stays concerned about the growing threat in Iran? Well, I, I hope it is a clarion call to everyone here and everyone looking on. But as, as war rages in Eastern Europe, as China continues its provocations, in the Asia Pacific. We cannot let the world forget that the greatest source of terrorism in the world is Iran and the Mullahs. And, uh, and I, I truly do believe that it's incumbent upon all of us. It's part of what brings me here today to do everything that we can to continue to to put daylight. Uh, and, I, and I want, I just, if there was only one message it broke through, and, and whether it's to all of you gathered here, many prominent Iranian American citizens, whether it's friends looking on from uh, Ashraf 3 or elsewhere in the world, um, is that do not be discouraged by changing American administrations. Because the American people's commitment to freedom does not change. And, and I want to assure you, as I travel all across this country as a private citizen now, that this is a freedom-loving nation. And that we will, once again and soon, have leadership in Washington, D.C that understands and gives voice to the cause of freedom in Iran, in Eastern Europe, and around the world without ambiguity. So I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged that, um, that 
the changes that are happening in the world, that, um, that that commitment of freedom is still there in the hearts of the American people. But to Mark's point, now is the time to redouble your efforts. I mean, the atrocity of the poisoning of girls in schools around Iran, the other atrocities, the jailing of thousands by the regime, the attempt to suppress a movement that continues to break out across Iran, is a story that needs to be told. And that's why I, I want to commend all those gathered here, and I want to be very clear because I'm a Republican and proud of it, but I am proud of the Republicans and Democrats that co-sponsored that resolution. <laughs> Now's the time for America to be heard in support of a free and democratic world. There were many policies in the Trump-Pence administration that changed the course of American discourse uh, or policy toward Iran, whether or not I was getting out of JCOPA whether or not it was significant sanctions, but perhaps none would send a more clarion signal than the elimination of General Qasem Soleimani, who many estimate um, was responsible personally for the death of 500 plus American men and women on the battlefields. Although there are some parts of this that we're not in the Situation Room today, but what parts can you share with this audience about that deliberation and why it was important that when he entered the battlefield in Iraq, the administration made a quick decision that we had an opportunity and you wanted to execute on it? Well, I could say early on in the administration, the president gave our intelligence community the directive uh, to find Qasem Soleimani. I mean, I stood at the gravesite in Indiana of, um, of servicemen whose lives were lost to um, IEDs that were manufactured by the Quds Force and by Soleimani. Um, and so this was an ongoing effort in our administration. And uh, as we unleashed the American military that took down the ISIS caliphate, and took down their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Um, the search I know for um, Qasem Soleimani uh, never relented. Uh, we received word um, toward the end of, of the year that there may be an effort by Soleimani to travel um, by way of one other country uh, into Iraq uh, to, in effect, stand with those that were menacing against the American embassy uh, in Baghdad. We received um, what we call actionable intelligence um, about his whereabouts. Uh, the president tasked me with pulling together the national security team for regular conversations, first in the Situation Room and then when we were spread out across the country over the holidays, we, we spoke several times a day with updates uh, with intelligence and defense um, and, uh, and then brief the president on, on what the latest uh, situation was. Um, but I will tell you, as I write in my book, um, you know, from time to time, President Trump and I had differences of opinion. But I am truly grateful that in that moment, President Donald Trump did not hesitate. When we saw where he was, we saw where the plane was landing, he gave the order and we took him out. And I'll always be grateful. And the world's better for It's been argued, and I would certainly make this point, that the maximum pressure campaign, the de decisive decision to take out Qasem Soleimani, paved the way for the Abraham Accords. I believe it did. Can you help share a little bit more on that and also what lessons are for future administrations about how often the policy of strength generates the peace that we all seek? Well, I, I look, I, I, uh, I believe... Uh, 
I believe not only did the action against Qasem Soleimani, unleashing the armed forces of the United States against ISIS, but also sending an unambiguous message that America stands with Israel, and we move the American embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, all sent a clear message across that region of the world that America would keep its word, would stand with its friends without apology. In the Bible that I try and read every day, it says, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will know to get ready for battle? And for too long, for decades, America, particularly with regard to Israel, had, had sent mixed messages that I think emboldened darker forces in the region to menace against Israel, to sow violence in the region. When we sent a clear and unambiguous message that we would confront terrorism, we would confront terrorists, we would stand with our allies, I believe that clear call set the stage for the first peace agreement in the wider Arab world between Israel and Arab countries in 25 years. But the Abraham Accords is only the beginning. If America continues to stand strong with our allies in the region, I believe history someday will record that the Abraham Accords was when peace began across the Middle East and the Arab world. But we need to be not only its author, but its finisher and see to it with freedom-loving countries, including, I pray God, Iran someday as well. Nasser tells you we have time for about two more questions. Uh, so let me ask, uh, you mentioned uh, this movement here and, mm -hmm. and also the, the reality that the mullahs and the theocracy do not want the people to believe there is an alternative. For despotic regimes, why is it important for them to suppress the notion that there is an alternative that provides the, the people a chance for freedom? Well, there's an old saying that you go with the devil you know. And it's human nature, isn't it? Stay with the familiar. And make no mistake about it. It's, it's, what, uh, it's what Mrs. Uh, Rajavi, it's why she stirs such fear in Tehran. It's why they don't want the world to know about the 10-point the plan, the alternative. Because the, the, for the people across the world to understand the inspiring vision of Mrs. Rajabi and the Ten Point Plan represents, I think, the greatest threat to the regime in the long term. I mean, to, to know that there are Iranian people in Iran around the world, in the Iranian diaspora, here in the United States, Albania at Ashraf III and elsewhere, who are committed to the freedoms that we inscribed in our Bill of Rights. To the idea that, and when, it, uh, when, when, I, when I talked to Ms. Rajabi today, of course, the first thing we talked about is I had two granddaughters in the last month. Karen and I have become grandparents three times over since I left the White House. And I must tell you, it's had a profound impact on me. I think about challenges facing this country. Our security, our, our national debt. When I think about the world, I want my granddaughters to come of age in. I feel an even greater burden, Mark, about I want those three little girls, one of whom could be President of the United States. I, I want those three little girls 
come of age in a world when they look at Iran and they see a free and democratic people. They see a people who in their lifetime struggled and won freedom just as we did in 1776. That's what I want to say. I don't want them to live in a world where the, the greatest source of terrorism in the world is prospering and being allowed to tyrannize its own people and export violence to the world. I want, I want a better world for them. And um, I guess that's my stepping off point, Mark, because I just, um, I know you have one more question, but I, <laughs> I, I just think there's in, in, in uh, that Bible I read, there's another verse I love. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. If you ever grow weary in this, and people in this room and people looking on never do, if you ever think of it, think of the little ones, think of the world we owe them, and think of... Uh, what we've built in America on the same principles that you want to see put into practice in Iran and know that we can build a better future for the people of Iran and the world. If we stand Mr. Vice President, for your stands for freedom um, in Congress and as well as in your role in the administration, you certainly have received your own personal security threats from uh, the Ayatollahs and from the Mullahs in Iran. Um, yet you continue to address this audience. You've addressed it many times. You've addressed audiences in Albania to continue to advance the cause of freedom. And you've encouraged this audience what else they can do. And perhaps the message is somewhat similar, but we know from your previous speeches that they are received today by the people in Iran via the new technology that they end up seeing it. What message do you have for those for whom this message gets behind those walls in Iran, for the people watching at home today in Iran, to your words? What message can you give to them before we close out today? Be confident and be hopeful. I truly do believe that when we make freedom our cause, we make his cause on this earth our own. And so you do not fight alone. And if you will just have faith, if you will have courage, if you will stand firm, you'll see a victory for freedom and a run. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President Mike Pence. She wants to address you on stage. Mr. Mark Short, and once again, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you for all your efforts and your role for moderating and discussions during today and in past conferences and your support for the just cause of the Iranian people. The residents of Ashraf Tree will never forget your visit along with uh, Vice President Pence and Mrs. Pence to the museum and your deep understanding and your respect for the political prisoners and their resistance against the Mullah's dictatorship. Thank you again for all your efforts. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Vice President Pence, Mr. Short, for that invigorating discussion regarding policy, U.S. policy towards Iran. We are incredibly thankful for the astute political leadership that they offer. We are indeed confident and hopeful with you by our side. I am now honored to introduce to you General Wesley Clark. General Clark retired as a four-star general after 38 years in the United States Army, having served in his last assignments as commander of the U.S. Southern Command and then as the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. Please give a warm round of applause for General Wesley Clark. Thank you very much <clears throat> for that warm welcome. Mrs. Rajavi, all of you in the re Iranian resistance movement, I can't tell you what an inspiration and an honor it is to be with you today. You're giving your commitments, your funding, and risking your lives on the outside on behalf of the millions of Iranians still in Iran who thirst for freedom. What a powerful statement this organization is making today. And I agree that it is in support of Iran uprising because that's what we need. And I'm very honored to be here with my friends on the front row, Senator Brownback, Senator Torricelli, Governor Ambassador Gary Locke. Thank you. Iran has always been a central concern for the United States. And today, we're living in historic times, times of potentially great changes, and Iran is going to become even more important for the United States. So let me tell you the story very quickly. At the end of World War II, the United States set up with the Allies what it believed would be a stable international order. We had the United Nations. We had the International Monetary Fund. We even considered giving our nuclear weapons to the United Nations. But it was only two years later that we realized it was all premature, because that's when we recognized that we were in a struggle for very existence against the Soviet Union and Marxism-Leninism. That was the first inflection point. There was civil war in China, communist takeovers of governments in Eastern Europe, civil war in Greece, a North Korean invasion of South Korea. We formed NATO. The Middle East and South Asia were roiled by conflict and change. Israel fought its neighbors. Monarchy struggled in the Gulf. And the Pahlavi family was there in Iran. The Soviet Union began its long campaign to create and foster terrorism against the West in Europe and the Middle East. Oil became the strategic commodity, and the Soviet Union, the communists, had to be kept away from the Persian Gulf. They had to be. Well, it was Britain's job first, but Britain pulled back in 1971, and then the United States relied on the two pillars. Saudi Arabia and Iran. But with Iran, despite U.S. assistance and many of my friends who served there during the 1970s, there were problems. You see, the Shah of Iran had another agenda. His agenda wasn't freedom, democracy, and blocking communism. It was just a little bit different. 
He sought empire, personal aggrandizement. He took the lead within the newly formed Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. He pressed for continuing hikes in the price of oil. He used that money in his thirst for modern weaponry from the United States, like the F-14 fighters. He envisioned a defense budget and forces in excess not only of what he could afford, but what was actually required. It seemed that each year he pressed for higher oil prices, more weapons, and at home, greater repression as he diverted critically needed resources to plans for possible aggression against his neighbors in the Gulf. By 1977-78, the Shah's megalomania, repressive policies at home, and erratic foreign policies convinced the U.S. government to pull back its support. And in the face of rising popular Iranian discontent, a U.S. general was actually sent to encourage the U.S.-backed Iranian military to remain non-political. There was hope, hope for a democratic transition in Iran, and then it all collapsed. As a radical cleric returned from France, seized control with a fundamentalist agenda, and for the past 44 years has waged a strongly anti-American campaign for regional hegemony built on tyrannical repression at home and terrorism abroad. That's got to end. That has to be ended. For the people of Iran, who long for freedom and democratic rule, there's been no relief. The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and it seemed like there was no more threat of communism. The U.S. emerged as a sole superpower. We sought to be a global force for peace and stability. We promoted human rights. We helped China lift its billion people from poverty. We viewed ourselves as a benign and indispensable power. But the terrorist strike on 9-11 shattered America's sense of security. We struck back at Afghanistan and then at Iraq as a mistake. We didn't appreciate that it was actually Iraq which had helped keep Iran's terrorist hegemonial aspirations in check, and that it was actually the Ayatollahs in Iran that were the real enemy. Your organization, the MEC, was caught in the middle of this. For years, you resisted the Ayatollah from bases in Iraq. And then you got caught in the conflict between Saddam and the United States, and it took more years to clarify this. Now, now you're established in Albania, safely established there, and you're a vital force for freedom and democracy, and not only in Iran. You're an example, a living example around the world. But now, some 20 years after the United States struck at Saddam, we in the United States are facing new challenges. The emergence of near-peer competitors, China and Russia, challenging U.S. leadership and the very principles of democracy and self-rule, which you are struggling for. You see, we did a great job at promoting and extolling democracy, we in the United States. Now, we didn't always succeed in helping people. We haven't succeeded in helping you enough yet, in my view. But, but these ideas, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of conscience, free access to information, the right to choose one's own leaders, to dress and behave as one chooses, with respect for others, of course, to shape the laws under which we live. These freedoms are like a powerful, benign, infectious virus. People catch it. They get it. 
They want it. It's universal across mankind. It spells real trouble for dictators and autocrats everywhere. And that's precisely why we're in this position today. Neither Putin's Russia nor Xi's China can tolerate independence of thought, freedom as we know it in the West. Of course, neither can the Ayatollahs, and that's what this organization is all about. So it seems we're moving toward a new phase in the global struggle for the future of mankind. And will it be democracy that triumphs? Or will we descend into a new dark age of repression, of dictatorship, of rule by single men, single families? There's already war, as Vice President Pence mentioned. In February 2022, Russia lost the largest military action since World War II. So many of my colleagues were mystified by this. Why, they said there's no reason to have tanks anymore. Hey, the war is going to be fought against terrorists. Yeah, it's true. The terrorists are still there. But this is real industrial age warfare going on in Ukraine. His unprovoked invasion is a monstrous crime. It's resulted in millions of refugees, hundreds of thousands of casualties, a global food crisis, and a trillion dollars of damage, and that's just the beginning. It's not over. Russia is using this war in Ukraine to forge a set of allies against the West. China is joined with Russia diplomatically, economically, and perhaps militarily. And so is the Iranian government of the Ayatollahs. Can you imagine that? They signed a strategic agreement with Russia last year. They're providing drones, ammunition, trainers. There are Iranians in Crimea assisting in this unprovoked aggression against the Ukrainian people. <laughs> and they're trying to get advanced Russian aircraft and air defenses. Maybe they're going to build a factory. They're supplying, talking about supplying ballistic missiles. And of course, the Ayatollah's nuclear weapons program is advancing. This cannot stand. Now, it's true. The United States did try to regain or to gain Iran's commitment to this joint comprehensive program of action that would rein in the nuclear program. Uh, and, and it was canceled, and uh, the United States has tried again to regain it. That's unsuccessful. I think it's essentially dead. And with it, I believe, is dying the policy of accommodating the Ayatollah's regime. The Ayatollahs have placed Iran in the crosshairs of danger. The U.S. tightening sanctions, overwatching, Israel confronting the grim reality of a strike on Iran's nuclear assets. This prolonged period of regional ambiguity, of Western striving and failing to check the Ayatollah's ambitions, I believe is coming to an end. But it shouldn't take Israeli bombs to bring it to an end. That's the wrong way. The right way is the people of Iran standing up. in the Iranian diaspora can sense it. You dream of reconnecting with your homeland, returning home, and you in the Mech can sense 
the growing opportunity to triumph, to replace that repressive Ayatollah's regime. You can feel it. The revolution is already underway, step by step, with popular protests growing, determined, a popular democratic secular program announced and offered in a hundred different channels by Mrs. Rajavi, courageous student leaders who are challenging the powers of repression today, just as they did 50 years ago under the Shah. Yes, it seems inexorable now. The Ayatollahs will pass. And this transformation of Iran is sparked by and built upon the greatest revolution of the 21st century, the power, the leadership, the courage, the wisdom of women. Now, history shows that regimes are brought down not only by popular resistance, but also by the collapse of will within the regime itself. These demonstrations are so powerful, and they're growing. And surely, the families, the relatives, the fathers, the mothers, the children of those people working for the regime, they must see the injustice. They must see the immorality. They must see the futility of going against the Iranian people's quest for a true democracy. Won't they persuade their husbands, sons, and fathers to show courage, to withdraw their support, their tolerance for this corrupt regime? They should rip off their uniforms and rally with the people. Shouldn't they? I have no doubt that will happen. Now, will the populace throw off their insecurities, the strict interpretations, the legacies of past fears? Will they face the uncertainties of freedom? After all, in the United States, we're still calling it our democratic experiment 250 years later to prove that people can govern themselves they don't need a dictator, a monarch, or a tyrant. You must take the lead in this. We don't know what's to come. Is it just a popular up and up upheaval? Will the Ayatollahs and autocrats flee to Russia like they did in Ukraine in 2014? Or will there be a civil war wreaking destruction and adding to the human misery? We just don't know. But we can only believe that this organization is at the very heart of Iran's future. Your decades of resistance, sacrifice, steadfast determination, courage, persistence, I think it's unique in scale in modern times. There's never been anything like this in our understanding of modern human history. But here's the challenge. After this revolution, will you blossom into a new structure for a peaceful Iran, open to human imagination, even as you provide the foundations for a new government? Will you rally the technocrats, the fence-sitters, the still uncommitted, the fearful millions into a new system that's been so skillfully articulated but's not yet been tested by the fires of fear and revenge? Will you be able to provide both the justice and the forgiveness to heal a great civilization? Will you bring its former enemies your former enemies, 
to regrets and repentance, where you meet the needs and wishes of all the citizens of Iran? I believe the answers to these questions are in Mrs. Rajavi's 10-point plan. Last summer, I visited Ashraf. I met with regime survivors, members of the resistance. These are strong, smart people, full of fight, determination. They've overcome so much. They shared their stories with me. They showed me the pictures. I got to see some of the atrocities on a level I wasn't expecting, honestly. It's one of the most moving experiences of my life. And I just wish that every leader in the U.S. government I wish every American could have that experience to feel what has happened in Iran under the regime of the Ayatollahs. Believe me, if every American saw this and felt this, that regime wouldn't last another 10 minutes. There's so much to be done. And even as this revolution emerges from the protests, you've got such major work. And there'll be crises. There'll be conflict. You'll be called on in ways you can't foresee right now. You've got to have courage, perseverance, wisdom. You've got to deal with these challenges the right way. But you're driving toward a glorious vision a new Iran, embraced by the world, a full and leading member of the region, with acceptance and leadership in international institutions, working together in harmony with neighboring states, living, embodying the universal values of freedom, respect, security, prosperity for all. And as you strive for this, you're also helping all of us in this great challenge, because as humankind chooses between democracy and autocracy, between repression and freedom, you are leading the way. We thank you, we salute you, and I just want to say that surely, after your decades of struggle and sacrifice for the heart and soul of Iran, the best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you, General, for your long time support for the Iranian resistance. Your experience and your knowledge in every field, especially about the terrorist and repressive nature of the Mullah's regime by stressing on the necessity to recognize an alternative against the Mullah's regime that is a threat to the region and the world is very valuable. Thank you again. And um, the members in Ashraf Tiri are waiting to see you as soon as possible. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, General Clark. Freedom is indeed powerful. We all feel the revolution. Change is on its way. I am now honored to introduce you to Governor Gary Locke, former governor of the Evergreen State of Washington, former Secretary of Commerce during the Obama administration, and former U.S. Ambassador to China. Please welcome Governor Locke. Thank you, thank you very much. Several months before his tragic death nearly 60 years ago, President John F. Kennedy said, quote, the wave of the future is not the conquest of a single dogmatic creed, but the liberation of the diverse energies of free nations and free people. I want to thank the Iranian American community of Northern California for inviting me uh, to be part of your critically important summit here in Washington, D.C., joined by the people from Ashraf III, all here for a democratic and free Iran. And I'm truly humbled to be here to speak to you today and to express my support as you continue your unrelenting fight for a free and democratic Iran. And it's a special honor to follow Mrs. Maryam Rajavi, President-elect of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, which has put forth a 10-point plan for a democratic Iran, which includes being governed by a rule of law so fundamental to a free and just society. And this plan has been endorsed by 224 members of both political parties in the new 118th Congress. This new Congress convened just a little over two months ago, and to have such a majority, such a strong number of members of Congress from both parties signing on to this resolution is a testament to the power and righteousness of your cause. And thank you, Mrs. Rajavi, for your steadfast leadership and dedication to a democratic and free Iran. And I have to say it's been an indeed an honor to follow Vice President Pence and to share the stage and the podium with Governor Brownback, Senator Torricelli, and General Wesley Clark. I know that sometimes people refer to uh, him as governor or senator, but in my profession, I've been told that governor is actually the higher title for Mr. Brownback. <laughs> the people in the government of the United States of America stand in full solidarity with the people of Iran and fully support their desire to be a free people. And you are waging an heroic uprising against a corrupt and brutal terrorist regime. High unemployment, runaway inflation, widespread poverty, stagnant production, growing bankruptcies, water and electricity shortages, and growing starvation. The people of Iran are suffering under this brutal current regime. With the protest, social and political unrest, and major national uprisings of the recent years, and now the nationwide protests of the last several months, it's clear that the Iranian people want fundamental political change that will transform the current system of despotic religious fascism to secular democratic rule and a fair and just independent judiciary. The Iranian people deserve a government that respects democratic norms, the rule of law, and places the needs, dreams, and aspirations of the Iranian people ab above repression at home and terrorism abroad. It's therefore critical for the United States and other democracies around the world to stand 
with the Iranian people. Democracies must support the resistance and opposition groups that have played a crucial role in countering the regime's repressive actions and giving hope to millions of Iranians who yearn for freedom. Summits and gatherings like this remind the world that the evil regime does not speak for the people, that Iranians are committed to the ideals of democracy like free speech, public assembly, and fair elections, that human rights are universal rights desired by every people and every nation on earth. Since the tyrants governing Iran came to power in 1979, hundreds of thousands of Iranians have suffered arrest and death for standing up to these cruel rulers. In addition to being a state sponsor of terrorism, the regime in Tehran continues to suppress the most fundamental human rights of its own people. Women in Iran suffer under a system of discrimination and inequality. And according to the laws of the Islamic Republic, the life of a woman, literally, is regarded as, as half as valuable as that of a man. The combined effect is that women and girls in Iran, half the Iranian population, are vulnerable to violence and harassment permeating every aspect of their lives. On September 13, 2022, Masa Amini, an aspiring 22-year-old lawyer, was arrested by the morality police for supposedly wearing her hajib in a way that exposed some of her hair. Three days later, she was dead after being beaten by police, according to eyewitnesses. After decades of a regime that relentlessly harassed, demeaned, and subjugated women, along with squashing all notions of human rights, Amini's death was the final straw in exposing the cruelty and disregard of the regime. In the protests that have spread to all 31 provinces, 280 cities, and over 100 large universities, many women have removed their hajibs and cut their hair. And doctors and nurses have reported that security forces were purposely shooting at and targeting women during the protests. The UN and other human rights groups say that 14,000 to 18,000 people have been arrested, Three to 300 to 400 people killed, including more than 600 children. And the opposition group, the MEK, has released the names of 664 protesters killed. Four individuals have already been executed for acts in connection with the protests after trials held just within days of the arrest, and many more have been identified for execution. The protests that started after Amini's death have unleashed a broad-based movement across class and ethnic lines, all united in opposition to cleric rule. Merchants shut their businesses and workers joined in the strikes and the protests. Different from past uprisings, the current protests, spearheaded by women and young people and joined by men, have transformed into a universal call for regime change and democracy. From the Kurds to the Arabs, from the Baluchis to the various nationalities and ethnicities, and among the followers of many religions, all want a free republic based on separation of religion and state. And with every protester killed, especially innocent children, the regime has only fueled more protest. And it cannot be a coincidence that over 5,000 young students, mostly girls in girls' schools, have been sickened by some form of poisonous gas since November in the aftermath of the recent nationwide protest. Outrage over the poisonings and the virtual silence and inaction by the government have prompted fresh protests. As this summit demonstrates, Iranian Americans stand in solidarity with the people of Iran. And all across our nation, Americans are have been protesting Amini's death and the repression of the Iranian people by the ruling clerics. Even in my own state of Washington, 
Protest rallies have occurred weekly, regularly on weekends in cities all across our state for the past six months, with one event drawing thousands of people repeating the chants from the streets of Tehran, women, life, and freedom, and death to the dictator, death to Khamenei, all heard in Iran. And it's not just women who have suffered under the regime. Ethnic minorities in Iran have, are among the most subjugated, dehumanized, and repressed groups in Iran, including under the time of the dictatorship of the Shah. While the current socio-political and socio-economic situations are difficult for the wider Iranian population, the nation's ethnic minorities are suffering the worst social, economic, political deprivation, including the deprivation of education and health care. Tehran must be treated like the pariah state that it is. The international community must side with the Iranian people in their histor historic and heroic struggle for freedom and democracy. International bodies from the UN to the World Court must hold the regime leaders accountable for the decades of crimes against humanity. The 19... 88 massacre of roughly 30,000 political prisoners, the vast majority of whom were members of the opposition movement, the MEK, and those killed in the brutal crackdown of protests following the 2019 sham election of Abraham Raisi, and the killings during the current protest, and of course the suppression of minority groups. It's notable and laudable that the UN Human Rights Council recently voted to appoint an independent investigator to document the brutal crackdown on the nationwide protests that have swept Iran these last several months. But the protests that started in September 2022 are not a sudden overnight phenomenon, but yet another visible manifestation and result of 40 plus years of organized resistance to the regime. And during this time, the MEK and its leadership have paid a huge price in blood. The role of women in the leadership ranks of the resistance and in fighting back against the clerics is clearly evident in the streets of Iran. The revolution you are supporting is about bringing democracy and freedom to Iran. It is not about returning to the dark and brutal day, days of a dictatorial monarchy of the Shah. The people of Iran have paid a heavy price in their resistance against two dictatorships, the current regime and the Shah. I have had occasion in, in the past to speak to many of you in the audience, and many of you in that audience have suffered as political prisoners or lost family members at the hand of the current regime including during the 1988 massacre, and many relatives of those murdered by the regime are now part of the brave MEK resistance units within Iran. And some of you in the audience or your relatives, including as we heard from our MC Anahida Sami, have been tortured or been victims of the Shah's secret police the Sabak. <laughs> Iran will never return to its pre-September 2022 days, and it will not return to the single-party dictatorial rule of the Shah's monarchy. <laughs> Because the chants by the protesters in Iran include death to the oppressor, be it 
the, be it be the Shah or the leader. America has a, trout, a, a proud tradition of supporting the rights of aggrieved people all around the world, as Vice President Pence said. The people of Iran can be confident that President Biden understands their persecution and will always support their efforts for a democratic nation. Just months ago, President Biden said, quote, for decades, Iran's regime has denied fundamental freedoms to its people and suppressed the aspirations of successive generations through intimidation, coercion, and violence. The United States stands with Iranian women and all citizens of Iran who are inspiring the world with their bravery. As you work to create a vibrant new democratic Iran, let me share the words of President Barack Obama about the beginnings of American democracy and its constitution. It wasn't perfect. But embedded in this document was a North Star that would guide future generations, a system of representative government, a democracy through which we could better realize our highest ideals. And as General Wesley Clark said, we call this a continuing experiment. Let me just conclude by saying it's been an honor to join you today. Your cause is just and noble. And may the flame from the lamp of liberty that you hold with such courage and conviction keep you warm, give you strength and guidance. May there soon be a free and democratic Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador and Governor Locke, for your strong words and your support for the Iranian people's uprising and the Iranian resistance. Uh, you describe very well the brutality of, the, of this regime and the necessity to support the Iranian people for a free Republic Iran. As you truly said, the Iranian people reject any form of dictatorship. I have no doubt uh, that Iran will be free with the uh, determination of the youth and the brave women of my country. Thank you again, uh, Governor. شده ایران سرای انقلاب و آتش و اسیان به عشق سرخ آزادی بسا پرورد سرداران اگر کرد و بلوچیم و عرب یا ترکمان یا ترک همه اعضای یک پیکر همه جانیم و جانان از یکی ریشه در این خاک بهار افشان اگر کرد و بلوچی و عرب یا ترکمان یا ترک همه اعضای یک پیکر همه جانی و او جانان جانان فدای تا 
آتشین برد از زنان مردان برای انتقام خون یاران سر به سر طوفان برار از عمق جان فریاد از این مردم کش استبداد رها کن شل رو در کینه بار و تمر یفشان خون در رگان خش می جوشد آتشین ای لحظه ی توفنگ بیرون شو از کمین بیرون شو از کمین جانم پدهای ایران جان مسیح از ایران من ایجان پیران قربان هم بیرون بیل ایران جانم پدهای ایران ایجان پیران قربان جانم پدهای ایران جانم پیران قربان جانم پدهای ایران شهن شیخ لین من آزرخشی آتشین هستم من آن خشم خدا و خلق در ایران زمین هستم من آتش در جواب آتشم بی با کرد من آن آرش که مرگت رو کمانم در کمین هستم خون در رگان خشم می جوشد آتشین ای لحظه ی توفن بیرون شو از کمین بیرون شو از کمین جانم پدهای ایران جان مسیح از ایران بری جان پیران قربان هم بیرون بیل ایران جانم پدهای ایران می جان پیران قربان جانم پدهای ایران Thank you for your remarks, Governor Locke. We are all here to remind the world that the Iranian regime does not represent the freedom-loving Iranian people. We cannot talk about human rights and religious freedom without thinking about the Honorable Sam Brownback, 46th governor of the Sunflower State of Kansas. He was until January of 2021 the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom at the State Department. Mr. Brownback also served as U.S. Senator from Kansas for 15 years. Please give a warm round of applause to Ambassador Sam Brownback. Thank you all very much, and what an inspiring group to be here. What an inspiring time, honestly, to watch and to see the strong people, first of Ukraine, stand up to Russia, and now the Iranian people standing up to this regime. What an inspiring time. I, I like to see people stand up and fight, fight for their rights. Fight for what they're entitled to. And as the people in Iran talk about, all I want is a normal life. I just want a normal life. And that's what they're fighting for, is a normal life. Mrs. Rajabi, wonderful leadership that you're providing. Just delighted to see you again here, even this way. Let me draw your attention to the obvious and the difficult and the evil. There is a malign axis operating in the world today. Russia, Iran, Afghanistan, and China. This malign axis seeks to rule the world. They seek it using deadly force in their own countries, 
supporting each other in malign activities that they have going on, and they seek to impose this on others around the world. This is a deadly, evil axis. It's harmful to all, particularly their own people, particularly those. This malign axis is harmful to peace in the world. This malign axis wants to rule the world by dictators, by force, and by coercion. We must oppose this axis of evil. We must oppose it. And I would simply ask you, haven't we had enough of dictators? Yes, we have. Aren't, aren't we finished with this yet? The Iranian people, as I mentioned, just want a normal life. That's one of the chants on the street. I just want a normal life. Dictators aren't letting them have it. No more hyperinflation, no more enslavement. Just allow me to live a normal life. The Iranian regime has already lost the hearts of their own people. They are now losing control of their own country. They need to. The Iranian people can and will throw off their rulers. They are doing so now. I pray for their success of the people of Iran to end this night of tyranny and to be free, to be free. The Iranian regime will start losing control of some regions, and this is happening soon. This is going to happen, and it's happening now. This is the most sustained protest in the history of this illegitimate regime of what is taking place right now. We need to remind Europe, we need to remind Europe that it's the Iranian mullahs who are arming Russia against Ukraine and against Europe and against democracy. We need to remind Europe, we need, we need to, in the United States and the European governments, to heavily sanction Iran. Iran needs to be heavily sanctioned by the West. This will further weaken the regimes. We should not be supporting these regimes with our economies. We should not be supporting the Iranians. And I think also we need to remind Islam, and people from Islamic countries need to be reminded that what the dictating mullahs are doing harms Islam. This harms Islam. It drives people away. Do the Taliban rulers of Afghanistan draw people to Islam by what they are doing? It repels people, and neither does the Iranian regime. Faith attracts. Dictatorships repel. Faith attracts. There's no compulsion other, under Islam. There is complete compulsion under the Iranian regime. If you have to force somebody to believe, that's not a religion, that's not a faith, that's slavery. The wonderful and talented people of Iran need to be able to pick their own way, to pick their own leaders, and to change their leaders. It's time for the Iranian regime to go. It is past time for this Iranian regime to go. And. The beautiful thing about the moment right now is they are leaving. The people are kicking them out. My message to the Iranian people from this stage, my message to the Iranian people, be not afraid. Victory is yours and is happening now. Seize this moment and declaim the victory for your own people, for your own time, for your own normal life. That's all we want for the Iranian people. This is the time. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your support and your presence in this important conference. Uh, in this period, the Iranian people are aware and uh, they want democracy and a free republic Iran. Your commitment to freedom of religions and the importance of this issue for peace and security in the region and the world uh, furthers 
the argument that the mullah's theocracy must be overthrown and it will happen. As you truly said, this regime does not represent the true Islam and that is not religion, that is theocracy and brutality. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, Ambassador Brownback. Indeed, the Iranian regime couldn't be further from any faith-based school of thought. We are now going to hear from a great friend of the Iranian people and their resistance for freedom, who has stood on the side of justice for three decades now. <laughs> Senator Robert Torricelli. served 20 years in the United States Congress, both as a congressman and as a senator representing the Garden State uh, of New Jersey. <laughs> yes, of New Jersey, certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Senator Robert Torricelli. Thank you all uh, very much. Mrs. Rajavi, it's a pleasure to see you. General Clark, Senator Brownback, <laughs> Governor Locke, and friends. I was, in listening to Vice President Pence, I was thinking of 30, 35 years ago, as a young member of Congress, I would meet with members of the MEK in basements in Maryland and Virginia. <laughs> Five and ten people at a time. I would tell my friends in the Congress that I had spent the night before a meeting with members of the MEK and they looked at me like I had no idea what I was talking about. Today I sat in a room in Washington, D.C., and I heard members of the MEK addressed by the former Vice President of the United States. Probably the most decorated, most highly respected officer of the United States Army in our generation. And two of the finest public officials who served as governor and senator that you will meet in the United States. How far we have come! I'm loath to admit this, but the simple truth is I have probably been in Washington in public office longer than anyone in the room. <laughs> Long enough that I can say this with authority. I have signed letters for the security of Israel. I have led letters for the unity of Ireland. I have led letters for uh, recognizing the suffering of the Armenian people, and I've signed anything Italy wanted. <laughs> but I have never, in my many years in this city, in this Congress, ever seen 
225 members of Congress sign a letter for Iranian freedom in a bipartisan unity unlike anything I've ever seen. And if there are those still in the regime who believe that as time passes, disunity will come, we will lose our focus, we will lose our way. To those Ayatollahs, read that letter, watch what we say, watch what we do. We are going to nowhere but Tehran in a new regime. So, so many of us have met on so many occasions. I, the faces are familiar. Some of the words are the same. But somehow, something is fundamentally different. We meet this day in this room, and you know something has changed. The pot has been boiling. Pressure has been building. It has been coming for years, and it is about to boil over in a new revolution in Iran. You can feel it. You can feel it, you can taste it, it is in your hands. Thinking about the students who've left their classrooms, the mothers who have watched their sons and daughters leave home to take to the streets, the workers that close their shops, it is mounting like a tide. And the day will come, as General Clark has suggested, that among them will be the soldiers who take off their uniforms and stand not with the mullahs, but with the people. That is the final day of this revolution. But even without the regime having fallen, we are close enough to have an honest conversation because we did not fight all these years. All the young Iranians did not lose their lives. People have not languished in jail. People have not been tortured to be denied again. The Iranian people had a revolution, and it was stolen. It will not be stolen again by anyone. act before, the train starts leaving the station, headed to victory. And as it's leaving, people try to grab on board. I got it. I got it. Be careful of it. Be careful of it. Everyone is welcome to this cause. Everyone. Iranian and non-Iranian. The past is the past. We're moving forward. But we are not exchanging a theocracy for another kleptocracy. To our friends who have lived the good life behind the gilded gates of their Beverly Hills homes, and those who have enjoyed the good life in the hills of Switzerland, we welcome you to the cause, but we are not, we have not fought, we have not died, we have not struggled to replace one dictatorship with another dictatorship. It will not happen. This time, democracy. This time, the people. The people. It is about the people of Iran. This revolution 
This revolution is no one's financial opportunity. It is everyone's opportunity to live free and breathe free. This is different. There are so many heroes in this struggle, even as it goes on, but some are worth noting. I take nothing from those who stand at the barricades, who will put everything on the line. But the fact is, revolutions don't happen by chance. There are leaders. There are always some whose head is a little bit above the crowd. To the leader of every revolutionary cell in Iran, everyone who organized friends and neighbors, every member of the MEK in Iran who assured that the struggle would go on. History will never forget you. We will never forget you. There are many heroes, but there are none like you. To the MEK in Iran who have risked everything, whose very actions are a cause for their execution, God bless you. We thank you. History will be yours. In any struggle, in any mass movement, just as the hour gets close to victory, there will always be those who say, but it would be faster if we would compromise. It would be easier if we would take a little less. It would be better if we would broaden the coalition to those who have a different vision of the future. Not this time. Our vision is clear. It is Mrs. Rajavi's 10-point plan. Iran will be democratic. Women will be respected with equal rights. It will be non-nuclear. It will be at peace with its neighbors and its friends. It will assure quality, free life for the Iranian people. There will be no compromise. We will stand for no less. My friends, uh, I cannot tell you the day this will happen. But as more than a few speakers have said to you today, there is an inevitability about the cause of freedom. A great people with one of the world's richest cultures, one of the foundations of civilization, will not be bound in chains forever. Another generation of Iranian mothers and children will not see their children raised in poverty. Being Iranian should not mean that not only you are not free, but you are destitute. That is not in any law of God or man. It has happened because a revolution was stolen, and we are committed that it will end. This generation of Iranians must join the prosperity that has lifted boats all around the world. People in every corner of the globe are finding a new prosperity, a new way to live, a new respect for human rights and human liberties. Women throughout the globe are finding equality in their lives and their opportunities. By what measure, by what logic would a single nation be different? The poison that has destroyed lives for a generation of Iranians is spreading. The Iranian people now are to be part of what is happening in the Ukraine, oppressing those people. They're to be in league with the North Koreans or the Chinese. That is not the history of Iran. It is not who you are. This ship will be righted. I have said to you many times before, but I repeat it again to those who may hear my voice for the first time. There are two kinds of Iranians. Those who are part of this movement and those who will spend the rest of their lives denying that they weren't part of this movement.
whether you live in Iran or part of the diaspora, will be accountable. Your children and their children are going to ask, in those days of 2023, when people were on the streets and your nation was enslaved, whether you lived in Beverly Hills or New York or London or in a city or town in Iran, where were you, Dad? Mom? Grandpa? Where were you? What did you do? How did our family end the nightmare and change the course of Iranian history? My only suggestion to this is whether you're hearing my voice in Tehran or London or Paris, you better have an answer because your children are going to demand one. Stand with this woman, Maryam Rajavi. Stand with the MEK. Stand with the Iranian people. Be part of the future. Put an end to the past. Revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Senator, uh, for your support and your strong words. You are a true friend of the Iranian resistance, especially in hardship, and you are an advocate of human rights and freedom. As you said, uh, you have seen lots of ups and downs with our movement uh, over the past decades, but you have always been on the right side of history. As uh, you have always said, Iran will be free. Yes, as you said, this time will be democracy, and this time will be freedom. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. مجدده همه دستان در کاران این گرد همایی تشکر می کنم. درود بر همه شما از جمله آناهیت های عزیزم. I would like to appreciate and thanks uh, all of you who have participated and especially Anahida who had monitored this program. I have seen in you uh, resolve. And also I was glad to see our brothers from Kurdistan, our Kurdish uh, brothers and sisters. And I would like to also say to my uh, friends in Ashraf Tree and said to you that you have been uh, in all fronts of the struggle against this regime. You are the voice of justice and peace in Iran. And you have shown that the struggle and uprising of the Iranian people is not going to be uh, shut down and never be ending. So I applaud you and hail your courage. Thank you. Senator Torricelli, we have come a long way. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being a friend we can count on in this journey to a free Iran. You have now heard from great speakers today who have provided a clear depiction of what is happening on the ground in Iran and what the global community should do to facilitate democratic change. We also had the privilege of having Ashraf Three with us. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, the last segment of our program is now ahead of us. We would like to ask the audience to please join in commencing our march from the Japanese Memorial Park across the street, moving towards the National Mall. We will also be visiting an incredibly moving exhibition of pictures of hundreds of women who have fallen for freedom in Iran. With a short pause to get prepared, we will start heading back.